I know you've already been through some talks already, so I won't go into huge amounts of details on the clinical stuff because I think you've covered that. But um, I'm going to cover quite a few areas. So it's important to have a just a general understanding of the basal ganglia in the in the brain, um, which is a part of the brain where Parkinson's affects. And um, you can see down the bottom there the substantia nigra. Um, so it's the substantia nigra pars compactor where dopamine is produced and damage there is the cause of idiopathic Parkinson's. All right, And there are lots of circuits within the basal ganglia, um, rather than getting into too much detail, that um, increase movement. And if there's um, damage there, um, reduce dopamine, um, which is the sort of movement hormone, then we get this <coughs> clinical syndrome um, of Parkinsonism. So Parkinsonism isn't necessarily Parkinson's <coughs> disease, it's important to, to note. Um, it's a clinical syndrome where you get a combination of bradykinesia, so bradykinesia is an essential element, which is not just slowness of movement, but also fatigue and decrement. So one of the tests I usually do is getting the patients to do this with their finger, so looking for the speed and the amplitude, and over time that might get slower and stiffer and more difficult, so that's bradykinesia. Then they may or may not have some of these other features which you know of, so rigidity, so lead pipe means it's a continuous increase in tone along the whole range of movement, rather than a uh, velocity dependent increase in tone with spasticity. Uh, you may see that's worse with synchronesis, meaning if you move the opposite side of the body, the tone gets increased. So you, you can see that when you check tone in one arm, ask them to move the other hand up and down and it will get stiffer. So that's a sort of phenomenon in Parkinson's. Tremor. Um, so the tremor, as you know, is a resting tremor. It's sort of a pill rolling um, type of tremor. People actually used to physically roll pills. Um, this is before the days of Pharmac probably. And um, you, when you see, um, see these patients and you check the movement of the wrist, it, there's this cogwheeling feeling. So that's actually the tremor intruding into the movement rather than a type of rigidity per se. Um, and then postural instability is, is quite common sort of later on in Parkinson's disease, but um, earlier on in some of the other Parkinson's plus conditions. So you may see people sort of shuffling, turning with extra steps, it's turning on blocks, so it is a block rigidly. Um, yeah. Okay, so you've already gone through the examination. This is the sort of stereotypical picture of someone with um, Parkinson's disease that people think everyone's like, but in the early stages it's much more subtle than this. And so you have to go through quite a few areas. You have to observe them walking to the room, looking at their face. You want to check their blink rate. Um, it's a bit of a feel thing, and once you get to see a few patients, you'll just sort of spot it. Um, make, see if they're swinging their arms when they're moving. Um, if they're, um, if they're looking a bit unsteady, you can do this thing called the pullback test, which we'll talk about in a second, but basically you just stand behind them, pull them back from the shoulders and see if they can hold their balance. And um, you have to be quite careful to instruct them properly because um, they may just keep falling you have to catch them. Okay? So make sure you catch them. Um, yeah, so you've been through all this. Talk about postural deformity. So that woman has camptocormia, which just means sort of bent over. And it's, it's not a fixed... Um, dystonia. So when you get them to lie on the bed, they'll be able to straighten out, but then they'll flex forward as they're mobilising. Pisa syndrome means going to the side instead of going forward. Um, Anterocollis is something which you can see, head drop, basically. And that can be quite sort of disabling, especially when people get dribbling and find it hard to swallow. And so apart from Parkinson's disease, there are lots of other causes of Parkinsonism. Okay. Um, that we need to sort of bear in mind. And the most important one to really think about, well, one of the most important, is um, drugs. So dopamine blocking drugs, that's um, metoclopramide, pro procolperazine, um, or stematil, um, any antipsychotics. Um, if someone's been on those, or is on those, um, you've got to think about drug-induced or tardive dy dystonia, Parkinsonism. And it's very hard to sort of make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease when someone's already on those medications. You just don't give Parkinson's patients a lot of these medications if you can avoid it. Yeah, and we'll go through some of these Parkinson's Plus syndromes like in the, the acronyms below Parkinson's <laughs> disease. I think I put the coffee and the cigarette in there saying that there's some vague, um, uh, some dodgy sort of study saying that smoking or caffeine may be protective, but I don't think I necessarily believe it. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so just talking about Parkinson's disease um, in general. So... It was um, first coined by James Parkinson. Um, has anyone talked about the history at all yet? Um, a little bit? Okay, because okay, okay, okay. I won't go through the whole thing. But he's, he's an interesting chap, um, surgeon working in London, and 
Hobson Square, and he just observed people on the street who he thought had Parkinson's. Well, what he said was this um, shaking palsy, and he wrote this sort of description of all these sort of patients. Some of them he just observed at a distance at a park, which is quite sort of you know interesting thing to do. And he's also involved in um, uh, studies on appendicitis. He was a geologist, and he, all, and he was involved with some. Um, plot to assassinate the king at the time, part of the French Revolution. It's so a quite interesting sort of guy. Um, <laughs> and then it was later on that um, uh, it was, um, oh, so the name escapes me now, but one of the most the famous neurologists in France, uh, uh, Charcot, yes, yeah, Charcot. So he, um, he actually called it Parkinson's disease after Parkinson. Yeah. And so it's a reasonably common condition that gets more with age, more in men. Um, there are weak environmental associations which have been, sort of been disbunged a little bit lately, so the whole idea of um, various chemicals, well water, farm living, it's sort of been a little bit um, put to the side, um, doesn't, hasn't held up in more sort of robust trials. The genetic causes are rare, but um, if you have a young patient you certainly can think about that. So a young patient with an autosomal dominant inheritance. Um, think of LARC2. It's a, if it's a young patient without much of a family history, the most common type is Parkin mutation, uh, which is recessive. So that, and the earlier you go, the more chance of a mutation. Um, yeah, and just for the new criteria sort of came out in 2015, and it just mentioned a few little interesting caveats. So if someone's got early dementia, that's not necessarily an exclusion. So there's this overlap with dementia of Lewy bodies, but some patients with early Parkinson's can have cognitive decline. So this is clearly, a, it's not a one or the other, it's a bit of a spectrum. Um, yeah, cool. All right. So in terms of young versus old patients, I've already talked about this a little bit. Um, this is sort of the rough sort of cutoff. So young being less than 40, early less than 50. Um, Older patients overall tend to be more severe, and you're more likely to get sort of quite significant rigidity in younger people. Um, as I've said, Park 2 is the most common cause of this early onset PD. And yeah, so if you're less than um, 40 years, about 50% of patients can have a genetic cause. So that's quite, quite high. Um, you know, it's, it, it's reasonable. But you know, Parkinson's less than 40 is quite uncommon. Um, they get some other features. So I've got a couple of these in my here at the moment and they get this lower limb dystonia which is it's often seen later in standard Parkinson's but uncommon early in um, early on and they may have an axonal neuropathy so some sensory loss and um, they get quite early dyskinesia so they tend to respond quite well to deep brain stimulation and things so we try to well, I, I do the mutation it doesn't really change your medical management but um, it's sort of good to um, identify. Like two is um, clinically very similar to standard Parkinson's disease, so that's a dominant inheritance one. Um, if you had a dominant family history, you might think about checking it. There are some trials with LARC2 inhibitors and various other things coming out, so it might be useful to categorise these people. Yeah, okay. So the pathology, just really briefly, um, quarter of an hour in, I think. So Lewy bodies, as you know, is sort of main, one of the mainstays. Um, of pathology, so these cytoplasmic inclusions, so within the neuron of alpha synuclein ubiquitin, um, the cells that get damaged um, early on in the midbrain are these uh, substantia nigra pars um, compacted neurons. The Bright hypothesis just describes how the um, alpha synuclein travels back sort of through the olfactory bulb at different stages to different parts of the brain as people develop more symptoms. So that's why they lose their sense of smell early on. But there's a lot of evidence suggesting the actual vagal nerve can transmit alpha synuclein to the brain as well. So people can get so this, um, the gut spread or the nose spread. And beyond that, not entirely sure, but it's interesting. So those are the sort of motor sort of features, but there's a ton of non-motor features as well, um, which are really important and become more important as time goes on. So I'm, sure, I'm sure you'd say, Jay. Um, yeah, <laughs> and Andrea, yeah. So um, here's a big list of them. Um, so neuropsychiatric, autonomic, sleep problems, sensory symptoms, and amongst lots of other things. Um, sleeping problems are common. Um, vivid dreams can be the early sort of stage. And it's something that people often won't tell you about unless you ask directly. Um, REM sleep behavior disorder, REM sleep behavior disorder is um, quite common as time goes on. So by, yeah, by 14 years, almost everybody 
has some form of it. The patients themselves may not be aware of it, it's more the partners or say they're sort of crying out at night, thrashing around the bed. So it's important to ask. Um, restless legs can keep people up at night as well, and it's important to exclude iron deficiency with that because that can certainly exacerbate it. Um, periodic living movements of sleep are slightly different to restless legs. Restless legs, you get this feeling of restlessness, then you move them around, whereas periodic leg, leg movements of sleep is just when they just shuffle by themselves. So they're slightly different in that, the way you treat them, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, painful dystonic leg spasms are quite common at night, especially um, in more advanced cases, so people wake, wake up with really a lot of pain in their legs. So that often responds to dopaminergic treatment, um, and sleepiness in the day um, is not sort of surprising. Um, autonomic symptoms um, become more common with time, so constipation, urinary incontinence, always ask about erectile dysfunction because people won't tell you, sweating, postural hypotension, all those kind of things. So postural hypertension is a big one because a lot of the medications we give, um, the, the dopamine, agonists, levodopa, they exacerbate that. So you want to um, check the postural blood pressure when you see someone as a routine. Neuropsychiatric things, so yeah, it's, it's again common. So early depression is one of the, well depression is one of the pre-monetary symptoms and um, people won't volunteer it. Um, anxiety is, a, is, a, is very common in Parkinson's patients and becomes a major issue as time goes on in some people. So talking about a little bit more, I won't go into too much detail because I think you're having or already had a talk. Um, but people can get early cognitive dysfunction in Parkinson's. Um, and it may be subtle to begin with. Um, the prevalence of dementia is around 40%, so really high. I've sort of mentioned there's a spectrum between this dementia with Lewy bodies and Parkinson's disease um, dementia. Um, and they cause a similar kind of um, syndrome. So people report hallucinations um, often at night. And the most common things are um, people or animals, um, just had a patient the other day who told me he saw cat's tails going across the room. They're all different coloured cat's tails. And he didn't, didn't worry him at all. It was just sort of quite a curious thing to see. Um, so most people are sort of have some insight. They're just sort of like, oh, yeah, seeing these funny things. But some people obviously get very distressed by it, so you need to treat it. And we'll talk about that. Um, early falls um, is a problem with dementia with Lewy bodies and other sort of Parkinson's plus syndromes. Um, it just goes along with DLB. Yeah. Okay. It's important to note that patients with dementia of Lewy bodies are very sensitive to any neuroleptic agents. So, um, yes, we, you probably wouldn't give them anyway, but you might, they might become diagnosed because someone gave them a dose of metoclopramide or haloperidol or something like that while they're in hospital and they get terribly Parkinsonian and confused. So, just to be aware. Um, investigations in PD, just one slide. It's, it's, sometimes we don't need to do any scans or tests if it's a classical sort of syndrome. Um, that's debatable. Some people would say you should always do a CT just to exclude a mass. Um, there's rare cases where you might get a, like a parasagittal meningioma that's causing brain compression and actually causing a asymmetric rigid syndrome and you know they get brought up a lot in conferences but I've, never, I've only seen one I think in my whole career but yeah, I, I think it's reasonable to do it. Certainly if there's any atypical features, um, you'd want to do a scan. Dopamine transporter scans or DAT scans, um, we don't do them um, routinely here, um, but they do have a use. Um, so I'm trying to, we're trying to get up and running it actually. For, for people who you're not really sure if it's, say, drug-induced Parkinson's or idiopathic and you want to um, prove the point, um, I think that's quite useful. Genetic testing, as I said, for younger people with a positive family history, you might get counselling as well, because um, it obviously has ramifications potentially for other um, family members. Yeah, so that's, that's not too bad. So that's um, yeah, 20, 25 minutes or so. So I want to get into treatment now. So um, a patient described recently it was um, what it felt like before they had the medications. It was like the engine was running without any oil. And I think that's a really good description of just not having this sort of the fluidity of movement and that comes from having enough dopamine. Um, but it's a bit of a nightmare if you um, sort of, when you start off, there's so many different pills. And often patients need quite a cocktail of different medications to get just things just right. And then it changes over the years and they need more and more different pills and and gets more tricky. Um, it's not just giving pills though, there's all these other people um, uh, most importantly, the uh, Parkinson's nurses and community educators who are um, essential to sort of making people happy in the community. Um, 
Yeah, so options for treating motor symptoms. So there's a whole bunch of things you can do. Um, I'll try and give you a basic rationale, sort of what I do and um, what works. Um, how to start is a, is a little bit controversial and actually I probably should change this side because the thinking has actually changed a little bit since I did this. So most people would say now that um, everybody should just go on to levodopa preparations regardless of age if they've got significant motor symptoms. So the time to start is when someone's functionally disabled by the motor symptoms, okay? Um, and you can judge it yourself. It might be that they're just finding it very slow to, to, to roll over, get up in bed. They might just not be able to use their hand properly because of bradykinesia. Th those are good indications to start treatment. Um, it used to be that we used dopamine agonists um, for people who were younger onset because there was a, there's a thought that um, you could then delay the onset of dyskinesias, which are caused more commonly by the levodopa preparations. Um, but there's a big study, the PD Med studies come out, um, which looks like um, it doesn't matter when you start them, they get the dyskinesias around the same time. So meaning that if you, um, if you were to take, um, keep someone off levodopa for, and then put them on later, they're still going to get the dyskinesias at the same time point. It's because it's based on the um, neuronal degeneration that goes on over the years rather than anything to do with the drug having a modifying effect. Does that sort of make sense? So the, the overall thing is just start with levodopa if they've got motor symptoms. Okay. It doesn't mean dopamine agonists can't be added on top later. Um, we'll talk about them in, in detail, but um, I would just start with levodopa. Occasionally, um, you might get someone who's just got the tremor. It doesn't really have much else. They're quite young, say. Um, you might try an anticholinergic. Um, anticholinergics, all they do is really dampen the tremor. Um, but they're quite prone to causing side effects, um, as we'll talk about. And elderly people who have got Parkinson's are very um, prone to those kind of side effects. So there's something I very rarely use in isolation that's pretty uncommon. And what do monoamine oxidase inhibitors? So there, oh yep, question. Yes, anticholinergics, which ones do you use for Parkinson's? Um, well, procyclidine is one, so 2.5 to 5 milligrams. That's one of my, one I use here. Um, we used to use trihexyphenidol in the UK, but I think procyclidine. Yeah. I'm not sure what either one else uses. But yeah. I, again, I hardly ever start it now. It's just, and it, it's not a... It's not a very, it's not great, very effective either. It might just dampen it a little bit, and um, yeah. Um, monoamine oxidase inhibitors are not as potent a treatment for the motor symptoms as um, levodopa by a long shot. Um, but some people would advocate them in early um, young onset patients who have just got mild symptoms, mild motor symptoms. I have to say, I hardly ever use them. So talking about levodopa, it's important to sort of have an understanding of how it works in the brain. So when you, um, when you take levodopa, it's a combination of two tablets. There's a levodopa preparation and then there's the uh, decarboxylase or dopamine decarboxylase inhibitor. So, um, so this um, in centimetres, carbidopa is a decarboxylase inhibitor and you give them together so that the levodopa can get to the brain. Because otherwise, because it, it basically gets gobbled up in the periphery by the enzyme and if you block that enzyme more of it gets to the brain. So it's a, it's a crucial sort of concept to understand. In the past before they had this they used to give huge doses of levodopa and people get very sick and unwell and with nausea um, as a result. So um, that's good. So levodopa as I said it's the most effective drug for the motor symptoms. Um, yep, see that. And you see how it's written as it's a dopamine decarboxylase um, inhibitor dose followed by the actual dose of levodopa. So the centimetre it's like 25, 100, it means it's 125 milligrams total, but 25 is the, um, is the dopamine de decarboxylase inhibitor and 100 is the levodopa. Okay? Um, there's different formulations and it's, it's important to talk about these in some detail because they really, um, yeah, they're not for everybody. The modified release forms, um, so Cinemet CR or um, Medipa HBL, I think it is, um, um, they can be useful, um, but they're not quite the great treatment we thought they were going to be. Um, so often for patients who get um, nocturnal dys, uh, dystonia off symptoms, I might start some Cinemet CR at night, because um, it can often sort of get them to sleep, and if they wake up, they might have a bit more energy to get for toilet and things. So that's quite useful. Um, 
the Metapro one doesn't tend to work as well in my experience, but I'm, I'm not sure why that is. It's got half the dose. Um, the, the half as potent as the standard release, so 250 milligrams of the CR Cinemet is the same as sort of 125 of the standard release Cinemet. Um, so that's why it's always a bit higher. And the problem, the problem with them though is the absorption. So they're erratically absorbed. Um, and so some people use them during the day as well. And I have to say, I've got a few patients who get really good effect from it, uh, but not that many. The problem is um, they might work one time, but then not the next because of the absorption. So people get more commonly get dose failures, um, delayed ons, uh, things like that. And they're much harder to titrate because of that. Um, you might overshoot then undershoot. So I tend to just go with the standard. But in saying that, some people do really well with them, and I try to put them onto the standard release, and they don't like it, so I don't know. Um, there's a dispersible formulation of Medopa, which is quite a useful thing to be aware of. So you dissolve it in some water, um, and it's, it's good for people who get unpredictable offs. So if someone gets suddenly stiff and slow, not related to it, you know, wearing off of their medication, then they could take this, and usually within 10 minutes, they can see to boost it up, and it, it's absorbed through the stomach still, but it's got a faster onset time, so about, but still about 10 minutes. Um, same first thing in the morning, people often wake up and they're very stiff and slow. You might have some dissolvable by the bed with some water, and you just drop that and go, and then wait for 10 minutes and then get up. So it's quite a useful one to have in your sort of pocket and take around. Yeah. Um, Duodopa is a formulation of levodopa that's given directly into the intestine, and we I've only had one patient on this as part of a trial, and recently I'm just switching him to apomorphine, so it's um, not really something we have access to in New Zealand. Um, there are combination treatments of levodopa and COMPT inhibitors, which we'll talk about, um, and tacopone, which we don't have access to here, but they're just, you might see people if they come from the UK or something on those. Um, just some pictures down here of some new, a new development. It's um, this accordion pill, which is quite sort of exciting if it works, we'll see. Um, it basically is a, like an accordion, it's all loops of um, this dissolvable substance, which means that levodopa is released in a more slow way in the intestine. So the idea is it's going to be like a controlled release formulation and to slowly give you dopamine over the day, but we're still waiting to see how good it is. I'm not holding my breath. Some possible side effects of levodopa. Um, so nausea and vomiting is the most common, um, which you always warn people about. So I usually tell them to take it with meals to begin with. Um, even though that might impair the absorption a little bit, it's better to not get the nausea um, and when you're expecting them to have a good sort of effect. And domperidone is the drug you use for nausea. Um, annoyingly, there's this um, potential complication of prolonging the QT interval, which I've it's quite rare, but there's a warning that we just have to check the ECG first to make sure the, the QT um, interval is okay before giving it. So, so we should do that. Um, if they've had an old ECG, that's, that's enough. Um, postural hypertension, as we've talked about, can be made worse. Um, hallucinations um, can be induced by any of these dopamine preparations. So someone who's getting mild so hallucinations, they could become much more vivid and and um, intrusive and so you just warn people about it. Um, most people don't, don't seem to mind. Um, somnolence and sleep attacks. So sleep attacks are a, a rare but serious complication as you can imagine. So people who just suddenly drop off and you can imagine driving that could be an issue. Um, so I tend to warn people about it. I haven't really, I've seen sleep people get sleepier but never, I haven't really encountered the sleep attacks as per se but it's supposed to be able to happen. Um, and later on, we'll talk in more detail, we get these on-off fluctuations. So levodopa does cause dyskinesia as a side effect, but it's not the, it's the substrate for the dyskinesia is the progression of the Parkinson's disease in the brain. That's the tendency to have it is caused by that rather than the drug. Um, and you don't want to just stop it suddenly because people can get very uncommonly this neuroleptic malignant syndrome or Parkinson's hyperpyrexia syndrome is probably the more typical, the, proper terminology. I saw one of it in a patient with it a hut not that long ago actually. Um, they just got it inadvertently stopped for a procedure and they got really unwell. So high CKs, fever, rigidity needed to be intubated. So quite serious. Um, dopamine agonists. So these are used to be the sort of mainstay for younger people. Um, they're still a very useful medication, more as an adjunct I think, to add on top of levodopa um, when people are getting a bit of uh, wearing off or not getting as much effect from the levodopa. 
Um, it directly stimulates the postsynaptic dopamine receptor rather than just putting more dopamine into the brain. Um, so giving a similar effect. Um, overall, not quite as potent as levodopa, though. Um, yep. So it used to, there's older ones that used to be associated with this, um, fibrotic reactions in the heart and pleura, but then they're gone, so don't worry about those. Um, the newer ones we use um, here, so Primapexol, Rapinarol, or R2, um, they work really well. Um, I find Primapexol is, um, is my sort of favourite for whatever reason, I don't know, it just, just seems to work pretty well. Um, patients often get a bit of an anti-anxiolytic effect from as well, so when, you, when they're a bit under-treated, you put them on a dopamine agonist in addition, they just, they just feel good. So it's a bit of a feel-good pill as well. And, and so I quite, quite like it. It's a nice thing to hold in reserve um, for when someone starts to get the wearing off and you can put a bit of Primapexol and they think everything's roses for a while again. Um, Apomorphine is an injectable form of dopamine agonist, which is also a very good option, um, and we're using more and more of that, actually. Um, there are injectable forms which can be used as rescue treatment, as well as the subcutaneous pump, which is a continuous infusion. Yeah. So side effects of dopamine agonists, as you can imagine, they're very similar to levodopa because it's a similar kind of drug. Um, but the one to sort of make you aware of is these impulse control disorders, which you have probably sort of heard of. Um, so there's a four A's there, but um, anybody can get them, so that's the first thing. But people who have got previous sort of tendencies, whether that's addiction tendency, um, alcohol, drug abuse, something like that, they're more prone to it. Um, males who are younger, have addictive tendencies, are probably the most high risk. And so I warn everybody about these, and you have to be quite sort of frank with people and say, look, you know, there is this potential side effect, which is like a there's strange behaviours, and um, you may or may not get it, but you know, it could be shopping problem, could be hypersexuality, you could start collecting things, doing all that. So you just go through a few things, and it's good to have the partner there when you're um, explaining about dopamine agonists, because they're more likely to pick it up than the patient, because it can sort of creep in slowly without people realising it. Um, yeah, and, and there are, everyone's got a sort of a couple of sort of horror stories of something that's happened, but if you warn people and they get onto it quickly, it's, it doesn't tend to escalate. Um, yeah. Do you have to then reduce it, or do you have to stop it? That? Usually, um, it depends on how bad, I guess. Um, but you, you might bring them in if it's really bad to hospital, and then if, if they're already on a bit of um, uh, cinnamite or lever, uh, levodopa, that it's less likely they're going to get a withdrawal syndrome. Um, but I wouldn't, if I could, I would try and re wean it down slowly, unless it was some kind of a crisis. Just wean it down because there is a dopamine agonist withdrawal syndrome as well, um, doors, or, which is another sort of rigid, nasty thing, and people feel awful. And they won't thank you if you suddenly stop their dopamine agonist, they'll, they'll feel pretty pretty miserable, so halving it might be a good option. But you can always talk to whoever the neurologist is, so it's not that common. Um, yeah. Cool. So monoamine oxidase inhibitors, I said I don't use these very often, but they're, they can be good adjuncts to add in. Um, Selegidine and risagiline are the two we sort of have in New Zealand. And um, there's a new one, um, sulfinamide, which is, um, is, has less side effects and is, is better, but it's very expensive. Uh, we don't have it. Um, yeah, so it might, you might add it on for someone who's getting some wearing off. Um, it's a little bit um, side effect inducing, so that's why it's sort of not my favourite. So people get um, some dry mouth, um, can affect the mood, they get gastrointestinal sort of side effects. Um, Selegiline is um, broken down into an amphetamine um, derivative which causes a lot of alerting and potentially behavioural problems and um, insomnia um, and you, it interacts with some food so because it's a monoamine uh, oxidase inhibitor you can imagine all the monoamine in increasing foods like the tyramine containing foods can cause problems so things like um, rich um, cheeses, red wine etc etc so there's a few foods that people have to avoid it doesn't go, go well with antidepressants and things so it's not the um, easiest one I'd, my favourite would be levodopa followed by adding a dopamine agonist and that works for almost everyone Compt inhibitors, this is something I, I do use um, so Compt inhibitors are it's just another enzyme, catechoromethyltransferase, that um, breaks down levodopa in the periphery. So if you add this in, effectively more levodopa gets to the brain. So it will mean that they, um, 
you know, they may get more effect, but they also get more side effects. So someone's getting dyskinesias on off symptoms, give them a tacker and they're getting more dyskinesias. So it may give them more duration of effect, but it's not going to um, necessarily smooth things out that well. Um, yeah, so we've got entacapone, which is a reasonably good drug, so 200 milligrams three times per day. There's no point doing it more than three times per day. Um, I think that's enough. Um, Tolcapone is actually much more effective. Um, it crosses the blood-brain barrier better. Um, in the trials, there were a few patients who died of liver failure, uh, but not, not many. Um, so that's the sort of caveat, I guess. Um, so you have to monitor liver functions quite closely with that, like every sort of week and then a few weeks for quite a while. But it's something I do use because it's much more potent. You just have to warn people. Um, a pick a bone we don't we don't have here, but it's a, um, it's it's a much better one. It's daily. It's stronger. So, well, yeah, one day maybe. Um, so side effects, as you can imagine, are similar. So there is um, gastrointestinal side effects: nausea, diarrhea. Um, specific to them, they make your urine go a sort of reddy brown colour, sort of predictably. It's, and also um, tears, like contact lenses, will be stained a bit orangey. So it's good to warn people about that or they'll freak out, um, understandably. Amantadine. So this is a, um, a medication which is quite useful. It's um, interesting how it was developed. So it was brought out as an antiviral medication, but um, um, they noticed in, inadvertently it had some benefits in Parkinson's patients. And so it's sort of a dirty drug. It works on lots of different neurotransmitter pathways, um, so dopaminergic, serotonergic, noradrenergic. And so um, it gives people a bit of a boost. It works a little bit for motor symptoms, but the main reason we give it is to help with dyskinesias. So if someone's getting dyskinesias, this can sort of dampen that down. Um, the side effects, as you can see um, here, this rash is levito reticularis. So that's something you just tell people about. It's not usually a, a problem. Um, and they may get some peripheral edema, so that's something people don't, don't like. Um, it, can, it does have some anticholinergic sort of side effects as well, so people can get confused, hallucinate. And it's something that if people are, um, when they progress, they often don't tolerate as well, so it might get stopped later on. So you have to be wary. If someone's confused, hallucinating, not doing so well, just think, well, maybe it could, could it be a mantidine that's doing it? And they, it does have a stimulating effect as well, so people shouldn't take it too late in the day or they won't sleep very well. So nothing, I wouldn't go beyond sort of 5 p.m. with that. So we've talked about anticholinergics, um, just for the tremor, but lots of potential side effects, confusion, dry eyes, urinary retention, constipation, anticholinergic side effects. Okay, so just briefly about cognitive dysfunction, how to treat that. So... As you know, Parkinson's is not just the dopamine pathway. It also, if um, you get damage to the serotonergic pathways, nor adrenergic. So purely giving dopamine replacement is not going to sort of fix all the issues. Um, cholinesterase inhibitors can also improve uh, function in Parkinson's patients um, to a degree. Not, it's not dramatic, but um, so rivastigmine dinepazil might be tried um, sometimes. Um, there's some... There's, um, you know, meta-analyses which show it maybe has a mild benefit. Um, when someone is not treated with dopamine um, replacement, they often have cognitive symptoms that can sometimes actually improve. Um, so if someone's got sort of mild um, cognitive impairment, um, they're untreated with Parkinson's, um, treat the Parkinson's first and then see how, what happens to their cognition later on, because they might actually improve. Um, also, um, I haven't mentioned it here, but if someone's depressed, treat the depression first before um, wondering if their Parkinson's has got worse. Uh, yeah. Um, I won't go into Nintendo Wii. Um, <laughs> but that can, there's a study in for lots of these things. Tango dancing, Nintendo Wii, lots of things. Just being active is a good idea. Is there something specific, though, to the Nintendo Wii as opposed oh. to, say, Xbox or... Or the, yeah, yeah. Or the Wii is a, um, it's a, active, if you've played Wii, it's, it's, you have a little controller and you're on the screen and you're actually playing tennis on the screen. So it's more that it's, it's an active whole body exercise. So that's, that's what's cool about it. And you can, there's all sorts of games. I've only played it sort of once. Tennis. It was actually, it's actually quite fun. You can have two, you can have two player, yeah. You can do heaps of different sports on there. Yeah, yeah. And it's good for people who, you know, can't get outside, they could have one at, one in the lounge or something, go and have a go. It's quite a cool invention. The next one is the Oculus Rift. I don't know if you've seen that. It's sort of virtual reality headgear. It's amazing. Um, that might be pretty intense. At the sort of digress, but at the um, a, 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 a,
Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bam. Head through the TV. Yeah. yeah. I went to the um, AAN conference recently. had one of these Oculus Rifts. It was one of the, um, it was Pim Viserin, I think it's one of the new um, anti-psychotics um, for Parkinson's. And you put on this headset and you're sort of in this room, you're a lady in bed, and you look around because the headset moves with, with you and you can see the room and it's quite, it's quite realistic. And you hear this sort of sound outside and you get up and you go and check it and, and your husband's like, get back to bed, stop being... And you go, then you get up again and you see these like children at the end of the hallway. Oh, you hallucinate like well. you're hallucinating, you're like, oh, that's a bit scary in the dark. And then you turn around and something's behind you and you look back and they're right there. And they're like... Wow. And it's, so it just gives you an, an, <laughs> it gives you an experience of what it's like to have hallucinations at night. Yeah. It's was quite, quite good. <laughs> scary, scary. Yeah. Anyway, so depression... Um, Treat the mood disorder first. That's really important. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if someone's got primary depression, they sometimes they look a little bit Parkinsonian. Um, SSRIs can be reasonably well tolerated and effective in Parkinson's patients, as can um, sometimes tricyclics as well. I haven't put them up there. Um, mirtazapine, I've had quite a good um, benefit with that recently uh, for some reason. So that's a combination of more adrenergic and serotonergic activity and it just tends to work quite well so 15 milligrams at night to start with then go up to 30 after a few weeks if they're not doing so well I oh, know it just seems to work well in my experience yeah my, yeah yeah so, so some people yeah they get a little bit sleepy but it's more for um yeah the mood but yeah, yeah. Do, have you have you had patients who have helped with their sleep or yeah yeah, yeah. actually when I was in the Netherlands because it wasn't subsidized here a mm. while ago we used it a lot just as a sleep mm. to avoid like um, Mm. Yeah, well, that's good. Just 15. Yeah, so 15 to start. It's, it's, I don't know, I've had a lot of good, good effect with it. People are crippled with anxiety being able to sort of get, yeah. have reasonably normal lives. It's, yeah. Hallucinations. Um, so often you don't need to treat hallucinations. If they're mild, people aren't too concerned. But if it's like the children in the hallway screaming at you, um, then you might think about something. So quetiapine is a... Is a, good, is a good one to start with. It's um, a new age antipsychotic. It doesn't have as um, much dopamine blocking effect compared to the other ones. And just starting with low dose, so like 12.5 to start with, um, you may want to get help from a psychiatry team as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's something you can, you can think about. Um, clozapine is, is very effective for severe hallucinations, but as you know, it's quite a um, cumbersome medication and... Um, yeah, so you'd obviously you would need a, to get psychiatry involved if you're thinking about that. Um, Pimvanserin is actually um, looks quite promising. Um, it's a new sort of specific um, antipsychotic for, for Parkinson's, and it's selective serotonin antagonist. So it doesn't um, affect dopamine, it seems. So people don't get um, sort of any kind of worsening of Parkinsonism, and it and it works really well. So this is quite good, um, but we just we need it. We don't have it in New Zealand. So restless leg syndrome, um, so this is a common association with Parkinson's disease, I've got another 15 minutes. Um, it's a similar kind of treatment, so levodopa can work quite well, so can dopamine agonists. Um, uh, there are other things like reticotine patches, we, that's a type of dopamine agonist we don't have in New Zealand, but another, another good thing to have. Um, gabapentin can work, um, as I said before, make sure they don't have iron deficiency. Um, if it's really bad, there's combinations of oxy. Um, codone and naloxone that can be effective as well because this can be a really debilitating thing but you would have tried the other things first obviously. Other treatments to consider just things which I've picked up um, chewing gum for, for drooling or sialuria is quite a good little trick um, if some people the worst thing would be to chew chewing gum so they won't do it but some people I've got a couple of patients who do it and they don't drool just because with, with Parkinson's it's not that you produce more saliva it's just that it pulls in your mouth because you're not swallowing as much so if you're chewing, it just helps it go down. Um, melatonin is quite good for REM sleep behaviour disorder. I think you can actually you can get that now. Um, and clonazepam is another good uh, potential treatment um, if someone's got um, you know, insomnia, REM sleep behaviour disorder, or periodic leg movements of sleep. It's, you can start that low dose at night. Obviously, it's a benzo. You have to be a little bit careful. Um, but in terms of which benzo I would use, it would be that one. Yeah. Um, Zolpiclone can also be alright at a low dose for people with um, um, sleep problems and Parkinson's too. Reticotine, um, well we've 
so we don't have that. Um, yeah, um, antidepressants for rapid ejaculation, if, that, if you ever encounter that, that's, uh, that can work. Um, it also obviously has a potential benefit on the mood. Um, caffeine, um, so there is some studies looking at caffeine, so it sort of gives you a bit of a boost in the morning, and um, it's something that people find useful. So I think they're just a bit slow, even though they've had their medications in the morning, a cup of coffee. Um, yeah, so don't worry about that. That trial is pretty dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's dodgy. Um, non-pharmacological treatments. Um, yeah, so exercise is clearly good. I won't go into detail, but that's good. Yeah. Neuropsychology. Um, so some people will find that... Um, Creating sort of positive coping strategies, cognitive behavioural therapy, that kind of thing can be quite useful for people and their families as well. Um, there isn't much evidence for stem, stem cell treatment at the moment. And unfortunately, there was a, you probably heard about a trial in Auckland um, that Barry Snow was running with, uh, with, with pig cells, so trying to, um, but it just didn't work, unfortunately, so far. It didn't look, it's a bit sad. Okay, this is quite. Um, important thing to understand. So advanced Parkinson's, um, you start to get these on-off fluctuations. So by on I mean when you have dyskinesias, um, so sort of these writhing career form movements, and off I mean slow and stiff. And often and it starts with just maybe a little bit of a wearing off before the next dose, then the patients may get some mild dyskinesias and then it progresses. So bigger peaks, bigger troughs. And there's different things you can do to try and smooth these out and, and it's sort of you're fighting a bit of a losing battle over time but you can sort of usually keep people going for five or ten years just with the pills but everyone's different some people will go for 30 years on the pills and they're fine some people will start crashing after about three it's just very independent and so very individual um, so the first thing um, one of the first things is just to take the take them a bit earlier um, before meals I mean um, so if you're having a high protein load in your diet, you can get reduced absorption. So sometimes it helps get you more benefit, um, but not great. Regulate the timing. This is quite important. Um, so people come up with their own ways of doing these things sometimes, and they'll take them at all sorts of times or just when they feel like it. So getting a regular sort of times during the day, uh, you know, every, say, four hours or something, that's a good way to do it. Um, then... Um, you may, after that, increase the frequency um, during the day. So you may go from so three times a day to four times a day or five times a day. Everyone's different. I've got, there are patients who take it every hour, um, and some of them think it's okay, but um, most people, when you get beyond sort of every three hours, that's too much. Um, so you just have to apply that individually. You may then um, add in a dopamine agonist, which I think would be the next step, um, and then maybe a COMPT inhibitor, um, tachypone. And then... Think about adding, or earlier on you might do this, add in some amantadine for the dyskinesia. And um, you might even then try experimenting with some of these slow release formulations, but in my experience that's a bit uh, haphazard. Watch out for a few problems along the way. So there's a single dopamine dysregulation syndrome where people just start popping their pills because they, they get, you get a bit of a boost from dopamine, a bit of a sort of psychological positive feeling. So some people just have this feeling that they're off. It's just like a even though their motor of symptoms are clearly on, they just feel not right, so pop another pill, pop another pill. And so you get into this cycle. Um, it's a bit of a worry. Um, impulse control disorders obviously can come out later as well. Um, and if someone's clearly psychotic, um, it's better just to take the medications down and wait till they sort of come right. Maybe they need an antipsychotic um, first, and then you can reintroduce the medications. Um, so say if someone got psychotic, antipsychotic, might sort of, you know, reduce the medications by a third to a half or so and then put them on quetiapine and you know, after a month or two try and increase it again. That usually works. Okay, and then considering device-based therapies. Okay, so apomorphine is a really good medication. Um, it's a continuous uh, infusion under the skin. Um, yeah, that's good. So you have this little pump, this sort of program. It's a bit finicky to get used to, but once it goes, it works. Yeah. Sub, so, so your subcard just injections, yeah. Yeah, so eight times a day you probably want to move on to the, the, the infusion. I mean, that's, some people do have those pen devices, and, and they can be, they're like the Medopa dispersible. They're good for, like, unpredictable offs. But if you're using it all the time, then you might as well just refer them in to get them onto a continuous one. It's quite a lot.
Um, it's not for everyone though. So if someone lives alone and they're not very good dexterity wise, it obviously wouldn't be ideal. The new ones have this nice sticker. So instead of having to deal with like little butterflies and stuff, you can actually just go put it on and it's on, which is so good. Like, um, yeah. And I won't, yeah, so we don't really have access to, a, to um, this anymore. Deep brain stimulation is a good treatment. Um, so young patients with severe dyskinesias, severe on-offs, deep brain stimulation is really the best option. Um, so we refer people to Auckland. Um, Mark Simpson's up there and he sees them. And we, yeah, so it is a good, good treatment. Um, I don't probably have time to go into all the ins and outs of deep brain stimulation, but the general sort of indication for device-based therapies are when people are getting uh, wearing off um, and on symptoms when they're not, when they sort of try to maximise their medications and it doesn't work, then you can refer for this. Palliative care is important, um, obviously. So if someone's, um, you know, getting later in their stage of Parkinson's, they may want to talk about an advanced care plan. So that's something which, you know, um, any patient who's got a sort of, you know, progressive chronic neurodegenerative <coughs> process should really um, be involved with earlier on. Um, you can refer them to palliative care for that. And it, it is, there are some hard truths which, um, you know, it, it depends on the individual how much they want to know and why. Um, but it is a degenerative pro um, disease. We don't have disease modifying treatment, we've got symptomatic treatment. So, in the last sort of 10 minutes, I'll go through some sort of Parkinson's mimics. So, things which look a bit like Parkinson's, but not quite. Okay, so progressive supranuclear palsy. Um, so this is, um, or PSP, so this is one which is not, you know, that uncommon. And um, there's some little red flags that make you think about it. So in general, um, if someone has symmetrical Parkinson's, so um, idiopathic Parkinson's usually presents with one side um, stiffer and slower than the other. Um, if someone's symmetrical, that's a bit of a red flag. If someone doesn't have a tremor, that can be a bit of a red flag. But about 5 or 10% of standard Parkinson's don't have a tremor as well. Um, so it's a whole picture that, that matters. Um, if you have early falls, uh, if you have axial dystonia, by axial is dystonia by midline, so their neck is stiff, their trunk is stiff, but their limbs are quite loose, then that's a bit like PSP. If they have a um, you know, symmetrical Parkinson's with a symmetrical tremor, it's usually a bit of a higher frequency postural tremor, and that, um, that's a bit more like PSP. Um, when they do their rapid alternating movements, it's usually sort of small and fast, and they don't have, necessarily have that sort of as much bradykinesia, but they've got that sort of slow, fast movement, so that's a bit typical for PSP. And the way they, they look, I think I had a picture after this, this is the sort of way people look. So they've got this frontalis overactivity, got sort of staring expression, um, that's typical PSP facies. The, su the, um, the supranuclear ophthalmoplegia is important to sort of understand. So it's not just problems looking up. So when you're over 65, you're allowed not to be able to look up properly. That's sort of common. So anyone who's got a bit of vascular disease in the brainstem, they will only get so far. But with supranuclear palsy, um, they can actually look that far, but it, it's not, not voluntarily. So if you ask them to look up to the ceiling, they might just look, not be able to do it. If you get them to follow a finger, they may go sort of part of the way. If you get them to focus on an object in front of them, so, so you look at, get them to look at your nose and move the head forwards, so you'll be able to go the whole range. So that's the supranuclear aspect. It's, not, it's a control from higher centres on the eye movements, but the eye movements themselves are actually working. It's just they can't get the signal to them. Yeah. Early on, it might just be slowing of the saccade, so looking from up to low might just be quite slow. And that's the sort of early signs of it, just slowing of the saccade. Yeah. Um, they may get a pseudobulbar palsy, that means it's like a strained sort of dysarthric speech um, as well, as part of that brainstem dysfunction. Um, cognitive dysfunction as well, so um, PSP is caused by, in the classic form, caused by tau protein deposition, and, and that's um, associated with other degenerative conditions like frontotemporal dementia, um, uh, corticobasal syndrome. So there's overlap syndromes where people get a bit of those, they get a bit of you know, frontal dementia and a PSP phenotype and they and they may have a sort of some apraxia in their hands. So that's sort of more of a um, tauopathy, you could say, just a bit of tau deposition. But you can get the PSP phenotype, by that I mean just the symmetrical supranuclear gaze palsy with other pathologies too. So some people just have standard Parkinson's disease on the 
on the um, autopsy, but they've got um, they look like PSP. So the the message is um, from that just to treat everyone with a bit of levodopa and see how they go, because um, even these patients if they look like PSP, um, even the pure PSPs they will sometimes get a bit of a benefit from levodopa, but it's usually a a more sort of blunted and not sustained one. So you have to you sort of undersell it, say, well, we'll try this, but, you know, it may not work, it may cause too many side effects, but sometimes they get good effect, and, yeah. Sometimes it's a bit of subjective, but it doesn't matter too much, you know, as long as you're tolerating it. Um, the MRI is quite useful. Um, so not sort of early on, but you get this sort of um, midbrain tegmental atrophy. So you can see this is like a hummingbird. This is the brain stem side on, and it's got this, like, sort of narrow sort of beak, I guess you could say. And this is a Mickey Mouse ears, if you look at the sort of a axial section in the midbrain, where the, normally there's a bit more bulk around here in the midbrain. This has just been hollowed out, so it looks like a Mickey Mouse ear. Cool. Multiple systems atrophy. So um, this is another classic sort of mimic. Um, you get Parkinsonism, um, cerebellar dysfunction, and autonomic dysfunction. It's a bit of a triad. Um, the autonomic dysfunction is, and cerebellar dysfunction obviously um, can be quite unique. So to have severe early autonomic dysfunction is very atypical for standard Parkinson's. That usually comes much later. So big drops in blood, postural blood pressures, urinary symptoms, sweating changes. Um, that might be something you see because of that. Cerebellar dysfunction, so as you know, so gait ataxia, um, if you see that in some of Parkinson's, that's atypical. It shouldn't be in standard Parkinson's. Um, you'd always do a brain scan if that were the case. Um, it's also caused by alpha synuclein. So it's the same sort of protein as an idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So they may have that, those similar pre-warning symptoms in MSA. They also get the REM sleep behavior disorder. They also can get the loss of smell, um, vivid dreams, and those kind of things as well. Um, it doesn't respond... Um, as well to levodopa, um, but some people can a bit. Um, and um, be careful with the postural hypertension. That's the limiting problem here. So you, you, levodopa drops the blood pressure, as we've talked about, so you may they may not tolerate it. But there's lots of things you can do to help with blood pressure. Um, so getting up slowly in the morning, you know, big glass of water in the morning, sometimes having a head of the bed elevated a little bit helps, and high stockings, abdominal binders, not that anyone tolerates those. <laughs> Corsets, no. Um, yeah. So neuroleptic malignant syndrome is a good thing to sort of. It's very rare, but occasionally, it's very. It's potentially fatal. So you get this sort of clinical picture in someone who maybe has got Parkinson's and been given like haloperidol or something, or they've come straight off their levodopa. Like people used to have levodopa holidays back in the day when they sort of go off it to think it improves their sort of. Um, sensitivity somehow, but we don't do that anymore. Um, hypothermia, hypertension, rigidity, and it progresses to coma and people can die. Really high CK, the urine may be red from myoglobin, or brownie sort of red from myoglobinuria. You, you know, they need to go to ICU usually and get these sort of strong medications. Let me just be a bit selective. Huntington's disease I don't think is really that relevant. Um, to this talk. Orthostatic tremor is something you see when people are standing up at the bench and they start to get unsteady and their, their legs start to quiver in the thighs and then they walk and it gets better. There's only one thing that does it really is orthostatic tremor. And if you listen to the fires it sounds like a helicopter because the tremor is very high frequency about 18 hertz duh, 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 sound. So I'll just skip through Huntington's. Um, so that's, that's, this is all cerebellar. That's, that's enough. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs>